If you've just spent the day at the drag strip, you've probably got a handful of these time slips. There's actually a lot of information on here. Let's talk about it so that way you can help improve your car and turn on more wind lights. So let's talk about the information that's found on the time slip for a brief moment. And I'll put this on screen so you can see what I'm looking at here. Uh, reaction time, 049 to the green. Uh, that's the time it takes for you to get your car out of the beams. As a bottom bulb guy, the rollout of my car is about 460 thousandths of a second, give or take, depending on the day. Uh, so I'm actually reacting to the third amber to get that thing out of there and to be as close to green as possible. The only way to improve that, practice. Practice tree. I've got one, I need to use it a lot more. I would like to get those numbers down. Anyways, uh, rest of them kind of self-explanatory. The 60 foot, the 330 foot, uh, Flying H Motorsports Park has a couple of extra data points like the 594 foot, the eighth mile, the eighth mile, mid mile an hour, the thousand foot, the 1,254 foot, interesting one, uh, quarter mile and mile an hour. To me, the ones that truly matter is the 60, 330, eighth mile and mile an hour, as well as the thousand and the quarter mile, mile an hour. Uh, all those matter. Uh, when you do this enough, you can probably dial your car off the thousand foot. I've had points in my uh, career uh, racing, especially when I was back in Utah, where I could dial the car from the thousand. I had enough data. Okay, so those are all important points to have, but what's also really important is those interval times between those sections. How long did it take to get from the 60 to the 330 and so on. Now, blow the dust off this. When you use your logbook, I've got a space here that you can add right in the numbers, your intervals or split times. That's really important because there's a lot of times you're gonna be uh, shifting in those intervals. Uh, typically on my Turbo 350 three speed, my first gear shift is somewhere I think just after the 60 foot, I honestly don't know. I haven't uh, figured that one out yet, but it's right out there. Uh, first to second and second to third for me, my car is right before the eighth mile. So knowing a couple of those things, I'm able to see some differences in the interval or split times to ensure that I'm hitting the shifts consistently and how that works. Uh, there's a big old spider on the floor over there. Ooh, we'll get him in a minute. <laughs> so, Point remains is that, uh, you know, some of these times are important to be able to look at the increments. Now, for a bracket racer or an index guy where you may not be uh, on the throttle, you may have the other guy so covered it's not even funny and you just uh, lift at the thousand to avoid breaking out, uh, you can use a previously good thousand to uh, 1320 split time and put it on top of your aborted run or incomplete run and you're able to basically come up with what you would have run for my car and a lot of other bracket cars the thousand to quarter mile is probably the most consistent uh interval on the entire track uh, i'm working on getting my car as consistent as physically possible and uh when the track is good and the weather is consistent my 60 foots are repeating within thousandths of a second and that's right where my car needs to be. So it's easy to see why those intervals are important. And you may be asking, what can I do to improve or tune those features? Well, that's kind of something you have to look at your car and figure out what it means. Uh, for example, my El Camino 383 inch small block, uh, that top end charge from just before the eighth mile, I'm sitting in third, I'm parked in third, just letting it eat. Uh, I go from about 85-ish miles an hour to about 102, 103, 104, depending on the weather. Uh, that's one of those things that on that long pull, if you're seeing some ir irregularities going on, that could be due with high-end mixture issues. And you may need to start looking at tuning air bleeds to accommodate those things and make sure that uh, the car runs as consistent as is physically possible. Now, getting into air bleeds, that's a little bit beyond where I understand uh, carb tuning. I've got some people that I reach out to that uh, I work with. Uh, Velocity Racing Carbs is my builder of choice. Uh, they're extremely knowledgeable, and when I need to make tuning decisions with air bleeds, I go talk to them first and say, hey, here's what I'm seeing, here's my data, 
This is why it's important to keep track of the data. So if you're working with someone, you could hand off your records and say, hey, take a look at this information here. Am I seeing something that makes sense? And given all that information, you and, you know, if you've got a carburetor guy you're working with, but you can always make the best decisions possible. So logbooks are important. And uh, I hope you guys start. I hope you guys are using it. And if you uh, if you aren't, by all means, pick up that freebie and give it a go. So that's great. But if you look at the uh, logbook page, I've got spots here for temperature, humidity, barometer, corrected altitude, uh, tire pressure, and wind speed and direction. Uh, those are all things that are going to impact how quickly you're going to run on the track. To me, wind speed is one of those things that I do need to pay attention to when it gets above about five or six mile an hour wind. Below that, my car doesn't seem to care much. But, you know, if you go from a dead headwind to a perfect tailwind, uh, things are going to matter a little bit. So keeping accurate records as to what's going on at that time is important. Uh, temperature and barometric pressure are going to affect the air density, which is going to affect how your car performs. Uh, denser air, you're likely to go, fa go faster as long as your mixture can tolerate it. Uh, there have been people that as the air density improves, the car slows down because they're uh, effectively too lean on the mixture. So uh, humidity. Humidity is one of those things that you need to pay attention to your car and how it affects you. I know guys on alcohol, uh, that number means a lot more. They're, you're looking at water grains and how that affects the car. Uh, my cars don't seem to tolerate humidity that much. So as I'm seeing humidity come up or down, I need to adjust my dial in accordingly. See, knowing that you've got a good history of notes, you're able to look at the history of the car and uh, make intelligent decisions about this. Now, with the uh, digital version that I've got up there, uh, link again is in the description if you're looking for it, uh, you're able to uh, use the find feature of Google Sheets. If you're looking at a barometric pressure or a certain temperature, you could actually go through and look at all those runs that share that similar characteristic. You're looking for 64 degrees as an example. You could you know search and find 64 and look at all the ones that have been running at 64 degrees. So that's just one way to do it. My logbook is simple. Uh, it doesn't do any ET prediction. Uh, that could be coming soon. We're working on that a little bit. But the point of having good notes is that way you can look it up and make good, intelligent decisions about what to dial your car and how it acts. So this is all important stuff that I know that you can keep track of. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you later. Behind the scenes, what you're not seeing is I got a fair few wasps that are cruising around and uh, I'm uh, hitting them with the leaf blower because it just pushes them out of the shop and... I don't like wasps that much.